Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order exactly on time. <laughs> okay, Ms. Thompson, you have the honors. I do the indication mm -hmm. Okay, let's all bow. Heavenly Father, I'm just so glad to be here and be able to serve the people of Alamance County. Lord, I pray that we always have wisdom and we always have empathy for the very people we serve and we always are willing to listen to whatever it is they need to be heard. Give us the strength to always follow you and focus and keep our eyes on you, Lord, that all our decisions were made through you and heavy prayer. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and get the Pledge of Allegiance to our great flag. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have a motion for the approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Public comments. We have no one signed up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Hopefully this may be a shorter meeting then. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have a motion as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and second. Any comments? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. It's unanimous again. Thank you. Okay. Um, Miss Hester, is she here? She is. <laughs> ah, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So today I am here to speak about Alamance County 4-H and I think it is one of the best things that I ever got involved in and I've been in it since fifth grade and I've learned a lot of responsibility from it and I've also made some of the most best friends in my life along with learning a lot of stuff. I've also learned public speaking which is why I'm up here today in front of you all sort of nervous but. <laughs> and I've also learned responsibility from showing my turkeys and I have my last, last batch of turkeys so I feel like with 4-H I've learned a lot of responsibilities and I've learned a lot of things that will carry with me through my life like public speaking and a lot of other stuff I didn't come prepared so speaking from the heart right now so I thank you all for letting me come up here in front of you all and thank you for supporting 4-H and thank you for all that you do for our county. And we thank you. Uh, I was in 4-H when I was in, in school. Uh, very, very productive program. Any other commissioners have comments? How many turkeys do you raise? I raise three and then I take one to the state fair and show it and yeah. How have you done? It, well, it usually depends on the year. One year I placed second in my class. Good. And I have a couple of thirds, a couple of twelfths, couple one seventh. So it honestly just depends on the turkey in the year, on how I do. Do you name your turkeys? Yes, <laughs> I do. So that means you don't eat them. I don't eat them. I ate them once and I was like, I'm not eating a turkey again. <laughs> I cannot do that. I cannot do that to my turkeys. <laughs> it was a little bit of like cannibalism, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Though my family says they're amazing. <laughs> they, they do say that the turkey's amazing. 
Well, so the family is benefiting. Then. Yes, the family is benefiting from the homegrown good turkeys. <laughs> well, I personally love turkeys. Mm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I guess that's going in a hole. Mm. Oh, right. <laughs> Named or named, or unnamed, they all taste good. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I just Thank think it's you. great what you guys do. I wish yeah. you were just loaded in all of our schools because I was on the advisory board with Taylor Jones when he was here. And the things I learned at the presentations about the back of the cow, the way the hand quarters are, I never thought about it, but it's very, very important when it comes to going to these places and the judgment stuff at the fairs. And um, I think Alamance County's just got great resources we need to have 4 H in every school, no matter what, because it's a great learning tool for kids, because you don't make milk in the back of Harris Teeter. You do you do eat beef though, right? I do eat beef. Okay. I don't show I don't show cows. Okay. I only show turkeys. Hey, you will be joining us, I believe, too, at the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners meeting next week, right? Yes, I will be. Okay. Very good. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Supposed to get a picture. Yeah, let's do that. Can we do that? Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Why don't you come up here and we'll stand here and have a picture with all of us. Mm -hmm. It's a shame she didn't have a bird. <laughs> <laughs> All she does is just in her pocket. I want to grab my turkeys. I like them. Put them in a little pack here. Yeah, what about a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just stand right here. We'll all just kind of yeah. scrunch around. Put them in the cat carrier. Just why you come to that conference. This is going to really be interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to see you there. Okay. Um, I assume uh, Miss Donner, is that pronounced correctly? Oh, Donner. Donner, thank you. Sorry, I'm kind of newly married, so I, I don't catch it all the time. <laughs> thank you very much, Bruce. We saw you many, many months ago when we were choosing Vaya. Yes, <laughs> yes, and we thank you for that. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited about all your new changes at the county and to meet Heidi and um, look forward to meeting Candace. And I didn't meet Rick officially, but nice to see you. Um, I'm Kara Townsend Donor. I'm the regional director at VIA Health, which um, covers 31 counties in North Carolina. We are really excited. We consolidated with Cardinal Health. All of that was officially done in, in April of this year. So we're still doing a lot of transitioning, but we're I'm excited with what I've seen with VIA. They're, they're high class, the organization. So um, I'm just gonna kind of go over what we're, what we're what we've been doing in the county um, I will preface by saying that the data I'm showing you is, is cardinal data. So we won't have the new data until the next quarter, but it will be interesting, I think, to see the comparison um, when we have that available. So these are just kind of the quick topics I'm gonna run over. Um, we have a regional board performance, Taylor plan and CFSP and CFII, I'll go over that. I won't bore you to death, I promise. Um, and I'm gonna get a little nerdy, but, but we'll get out of it. So next is, this, these are our, this is how our counties are broken up. So you can see where Alamance is. Um, I have about four counties in there, but we're spread out all over. Um, Via started in the West, so you can see we're pretty heavy there, but They've been around for 50 years doing mental health, so it's, it's quite impressive to see all the things that they've done during that time. So we have regional boards, and um, we are in Region 4. We're the largest region. Um, we're really excited of Alamance as a part of it because we really, we really love the leadership that we have with Alamance County. So thankfully, we have two great commissioners on our regional board, uh, Mr. Paisley and um, Ms. Ms. Thompson, we're really excited that they're here. We've been having great meetings, great progress, we think. Um, these are just some of the other counties and leaders that are involved. So here, uh, here's the nerdy part. So these are our dashboards, just kind of show you where, where we are serving people across the county. Um, just in trends, we see more adults in the county um, overall. 
and you can see IDD, um, that's intellectual and developmental disabilities, mental health, and then SA is substance abuse. Here's uh, our Medicaid service usage, so you can see kind of the different, sorry the slide's a little weird at the top, but um, we have adult only enhanced services, and those are really anything beyond basic services, like, like the ACT team. Um, we have ACT teams across the state, People that are receiving ACT services are really close to being hospitalized. So um, those are the, the enhanced services, anything over counseling really. Um, and you can see, this slide kind of looks weird up here, but our biggest service is in outpatient care. The innovations waiver, you can see that's, um, you have 182 people receiving that in the county. That's a big issue. The innovations waiver, um, we have 14,000 people on the waiting list for that. Um, so the the legislature approved a thousand more slots. So we're we're hoping that we can get a lot of, a lot more people on there because it really helps in their care, and but the care is expensive. It um, can top over one hundred thirty five thousand a year for that. Um, but it really helps people receive care in their homes versus in an institution. And so we've seen r some really neat things. Um, one of my favorite stories is in out of Chatham County. There's a uh, a, a young man, he's in his early 20s. Um, his mother is on our CFAC advi advisory board, which is our family council um, that kind of makes us, you know, understand where the gaps are. But he is just now living independently um, via people come in probably twice a day, but he's living in a tiny home and it's just really exciting to see him be able to do that. You know, they have alarms on the doors and they bring in prepared meals so he can make them himself. but. There are really great ways that, that people with disabilities can live in the community alone, um, which is which they love too. Well, the alarms to alert people for him, to, other people coming in, or for him going out. Him going out, and both, both. So the parents have cameras in the house, and they can see when he leaves. You know, they know when he's supposed to leave. So he might go on a walk, or you know, be walking home and come in the door. And so they just, it's just a great way to monitor him, but. They have, you know, a binder. They have like tasks that he needs to do, like a reminder to brush your teeth, a reminder, you know, to make your bed. So it's it's really neat. It's really neat to see. Um, How old is he? He's I think he's about 23. So he just went to his first prom recently, which is it was exciting. I don't know why this isn't. I don't know. Diapers. Probably user error. So this is the next one, just to see non-Medicaid. So these are state-funded services. Um, the 1950, uh, 1915, that's rest, those are respite services for people who care for their children in their homes. They get, I think it's 30 hours per month to have a little break um, from, from their, day, the, their daily care. Um, crisis services, you can see, there are about 90 in the county that were reported. That can, those are usually people who aren't in the system uh, they can be coming through the county, have an interaction with law enforcement, so we track all of that. Let's see. This is interesting. This just kind of goes over um, the top five, I would say, um, providers in Alamance County. Now, some of these aren't in Alamance, and some people will be, you know, receiving care just because it's specialized outside of the county. But as you can see, RHA is our is our biggest um, our biggest provider. A lot of this care is outpatient. Um, when you look down at Alamance Academy, a lot of those numbers are um, trauma and for trauma resulting in trauma. So um, they do really great work as well. But we've really been impressed with the providers that we've been working with um, across the county. And you can kind of see a map of where the members receive care. So um, as you can see, the the, the dark blue Alamance, we you receive a, a lot of people receive care here. And you can kind of see our, our counties are spread out, but I don't know why they chose this map, but um, people in more rural counties obviously have less people because there are less services. So, so our numbers look higher than Gilbert's Yes. That's interesting. It is, a, yes. I had the same question. Mm-hmm. Combined. And more. Is that just where people from Alamance County receive care? Now these are via numbers. So via does not system. serve, yes. 
So that's probably why, because why oh, okay. doesn't serve okay. Guilford. I bet you that's why. Um, but like, we don't love this slide. <laughs> So um, here is just here's just some other numbers to see. So you can see the innovations waiver slot on the left. Well, when people are waiting to get on the innovations waiter, waiver, they're on the registry of unmet needs, and it's called RUN for short. And um, there are services people can receive. They can receive respite services. Um, just they're 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 really minor services, but um, it's unfortunate that people can wait. I mean, anywhere from nine to, to 14 years to get on the innovations waiver. Um, so that's, that's something that's always a concern in the, in the state. So you'll see just, this is some quick data. Again, this is cardinal data, um, but you can see the people who are admitted um, to community hospitals. Now I will say the data is interesting because the state doesn't ask for data with people just coming to get medication. So they just want to know who was admitted. So it's not super specific. I think that would be helpful if we knew a little bit more detail. Um, but you can see, you know, the yellow line is people who have been readmitted in 30 days. Um, I will say that VIA, I'd say compared to Cardinal, does a really good job of following up after people receive care. Um, to make sure they're connected to all of their services, which I'll make sure in the next presentation there's a comparison so you can see the difference because I, I'm sure there will be one. These are substance use disorders in the county or admitted county hospi community hospitals. And I will say that, that substance use has been one of our biggest issues lately um, just because of um, fentanyl mostly. But as you all know, you know, the United States stopped China from importing fentanyl or tried to, to put a, a stop to it, but now they're importing it up through cartels from Mexico. And so we're seeing this surprisingly in these tiny counties. So one of my counties is Caswell County and it's the smallest, the most rural, they're hiding drugs in the fields and in that small county is the only county in the state where there is a, a US Marshal, FBI and DEA all stationed there to help counter this. And so I'm really excited that we're getting this, this opioid money. Um, a lot of counties are, are trying to work on, you know, through a task force on how to spend that. I know that uh, Stokes County, they're looking at possibly doing an app for, to help connect families, teachers, you know, students, um, and also users on what resources are available and then really help educate these these kids on, you know, a drug that's called Oxy on um, like a social media app like Snapchat will probably be fentanyl. And it's killing our young people. I mean, a quarter of a pill will kill them and they don't know what they're getting. And so just on Snapchat alone, there are over 80,000 drug dealers. So we really have a lot of opportunity to start educating our students and our parents, you know, to now be aware. Slow you down. Yeah. Snapchat, 80,000 dealers. Yes. Geographic, geographically, what does that represent? I don't know. Is it know. the country? Is it the world? Is it what is it? I think it's just the app in general. So they have different icons, and I can, I can, I can send you the, a picture of it, but, you know, they have different icons on how to get a, a dealer. I mean, they'll come to your house. Um, it's like you'll see a plug, and that'll mean something else, and it's just, it's, it makes it easy for kids. I mean, and young kids, and we're talking like 12 year olds can be on Snapchat and trying to get a painkiller. Um, and so it's it's a problem. Um, so parents need to monitor. Oh yes. What oh, the yes. kids are saying. Yeah. But parents might not need to use themselves. That yes. Would help, that would be a big help. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very interesting. I have two step teens, and my stepdaughter has has taken 300,000 pictures on Snapchat. She's 14. So it's pictures. yes. So you can just imagine. I mean, how how much they're on these <clears throat> these apps. I know it's concerning. How many hours <laughs> does it take to download that many pictures? There, on Snapchat <laughs> things just appear and they go away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they it's not really. All you really got to do is touch, oh yeah, touch they don't the really go away. They're, they're always really there. Always they're always there to haunt you when you are an adult. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, these are the ED admissions in the county. 
Uh, you can see the single admissions um, and then the readmits. And I know, I know with the Diversion Center, I'm sure that will go down significantly because as we all know in the, in the ERs, the medical staff to help just aren't there. Um, and the, oh, sorry, sorry, not a question. Let me, let me interject. Oh, yes, yes. When will we get our first? Our first opioid settlement fund. I, I just asked <laughs> Susan to check on that because <laughs> she, she's pulling that. When it may. Susan was looking that up while I was speaking. Yes. yes sir. Yeah. <laughs> Soon. I know. We, we have received our first um, distri distribution. So we will be needing to look at how we spend that too, in addition to coming up with a, a really good plan for our. Office. Was it like 700 some? <coughs> we received. Oh, get with me just one moment. $340,963.53. Beg your pardon? $340,963.53. Change, it changes, though, from the number year two on out, doesn't it? It goes to 500 and something, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And they're, they're looking at different things. I mean, I will say that Chatham County is focusing a lot on reentry. Uh, because we're seeing, you know, the, the prison population. I mean, most people have some kind of mental health diagnosis. And so if they don't have an action plan for when they get out of jail, you know, it's, it's very easy to just slide back in there with, with the drug industry and um, users and making sure they have supports when they get out. That's one of the big <laughs> issues. Um, so right now the state is going through their biggest, um, I guess, Medicaid trans transformation it's ever seen. Um, so VIA is one of six MCOs that provides mental health services through the state. Um, what they're doing is they want, and, and, then, and then so a Blue Cross Blue Shield will just provide physical health. So, you know, we provide the head and they provide the, the, bod, the rest of the body. Well, the state wanted to combine everything into one. So the person comes in and they receive whole, whole body care everything which is really the way it should should have been from the beginning and so starting in December um, you know a Blue Cross Blue Shield is going to be starting to provide mental health services VIA is going to be starting to provide physical health services but we will still see the sickest um, you know the most acute cases in mental health so that will still stay with us but that's that's a big thing that's getting ready to go live and we're also going to be providing pharmacy benefits so we've hired you know leaders in the ph pharmacological industry um, to help us so we're excited but it's, it's a big it's a big transition bruce i think i'm frozen sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, you can do the next one so this is a big thing i know that um mr paisley and mrs thompson are aware of this but so um, with tailored plan going on, the uh, administration in North Carolina wanted to set up a new program um, for foster care. So traditionally in North Carolina, unfortunately, we really, we really lean toward institutionalized care, unfortunately, and we really need to get out of that um, and really help our foster families. So right now, our our plans are regionalized. And so VIA has worked hard and around, around and all the other MCOs as well to create relationships with DSS and local county government to be able to transition kids um, appropriately and have really an interpersonal um, transfer of these kids. Well, this, the, the state plan would, it would have one provider across the state to help with these services and it's, it's really a shaky proposal because if the administrations change, this can change. And so we at BIA and the MCOs want a regional approach because we think it's better for the relationships. You know, if, if, if the commissioners wanted to have a meeting with the CEO from BIA, that could happen instantly. I don't know about, um, you know, I don't know how that would happen if this became a state-run state entity where we wouldn't be in control of foster care any longer. So you can just see kind of down the screen, you can read this later, but um, you know, there are a lot of things we need to change in the system. Uh, one of them is educating foster care, foster families. And so the county has their own set of, of foster families. Well, VIA 
we have therapeutic foster families when people need a little bit of additional services and mental health. Uh, you know, there's some things that are just that raise red flags. So, in a, in therapeutic, therapeutic foster care, they only have six more hours of training than a regular foster family. And there is also not a, a state registry of families. So we can't, it's even almost impossible to track exactly who foster care families are. And the problem is, you know, if we don't know where these people are, it's, it's really hard to help educate them and help see kind of what the issues are. Because as DSS is aware, if a, fam if a, a regular family or a foster family is not happy with a child, they can just drop them off at the DSS office. So we really, we really need to examine this system from the inside out. And um, I will say that there's a, a DSS director in, um, in Chatham County. She was awarded the DSS Director of the Year. And what she said was, the devil is in the details of this. Um, because there is no specific answer on how we're educating these families. So we really need to, to pay attention. Um, the legislature, they're aware, um, but but we really would love for the entire uh, board of county commissioners to write a letter. I, I think, I know Pamela Thompson did, Commissioner Thompson, and I'm not sure if you did, Chairman, but it would really be powerful for the whole board to, to weigh in on this. Um, and I can get you more information, but um, here are just some more, some, some more of our concerns which you can read later, but um, it's being rushed out um, and this is, and they're trying to, you know, put this proposal in when we're getting ready for a tailored plan. So we're getting ready to transfer, transform the whole system. So it just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. And I said, how you can help? Um, we can have additional meetings, or you know, it would be powerful for um, for you to write a letter as a board, and also to, and I would say the letter should be sent. It should be sent to the secretary. Um, but also to, you know, representatives from Alamance County. Is that the guy, the new guy with the, is with the really great hair? You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Kinsley, the Secretary guy. Kinsley. Yes, I think that's perfect. Hair. <laughs> with the great hair, I don't I remember his hair. That, but, <laughs> but I mean, I'm thinking, but are yes. you 14. He's so young. So everybody looks young now when you're older. <laughs> I would be happy to draft a letter on behalf of the board if that's the board's inclination, and then we can send it with signatures from board members. Do we all agree? We need a motion. Why don't I make a motion that we draft a letter on behalf of the board and support? Support of what exactly? Mm -hmm. Stating that we're not happy with what the proposal looks like right now with the state, that we would prefer a more regional approach. Um, I can use some of the, the points here um, as well as some others that we would prefer something that would better serve the residents of Alamance County. And I'll second that motion. Rather than a statewide solution. We would have more control doing it this way. Okay. Maybe control maybe more personalized care. Oh, yeah. 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 It will be an 800 number with yeah. the state plan. Right. Yeah. I'll draft children. something and then you can decide if okay. you'd like it changed or not. You see all the time that children get lost, they disappear, mm -hmm. or they die, and that's in foster care. Not everybody is created to be foster parents. That needs to be so strict of who is allowed to have someone that has so many issues that have been done to them to come into a brand new family situation that needs to be equipped with that. That is a huge, enormous responsibility. It takes a very special person to take care of a child that's coming out of such horrendous abuse. Okay, we have a motion on board. We have a second. Any further discussion of this motion? Well, I can say from experience, not in our household, but with my family, that it's a, it's a difficult process. And it's, yeah. It takes a lot of training, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of concern and care on the part of foster parents. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Didn't mean to interrupt your No, it was great. No, well, we, yes. So, in response to that, we are 
the MCOs are teaming up together to really make sure that um, children placed outside of, of our own region, that the, the, that the transition is seamless. So if someone's transferring from Burlington to Wilmington, there's no, there are no issues. But um, in your packet, it just kind of goes over what we're going to be doing, um, what the MCOs are doing together. And these are already in place. We've been working on a lot of this for a long time with DSSs. Like just, just you know, like I mentioned, Via has been doing mental health for 50 years. Um, so, so we're confident in our ability to, to work with counties. This is just, I know this is a busy slide, but um, you can see we're, we've raised the amount that we're paying um, therapeutic foster care families. Um, that's an emergency respite. You see that's pretty high per day. Um, this is just all the more reason that we need to have oversight of foster care to make sure the right people are, are doing you know this job. Um, so I'm excited that we're we might have that discussion and, and continue it. So that's it. I if you have any questions, let me know. Um, and I'm happy to just have another meeting if you all have questions about anything, because I know I went over a lot. Just would request that you meet with our county manager and work out this this matter. Yes. Mr. I Chairman, I do have too. one question, if I may. Uh, Ms. Stoner, the, uh, the General Assembly considered last term Medicaid expansion very hot topic. Um, if that were to pass, how does that affect Alamance County citizens' access to care? I, can, I cannot give you, I will be honest, specifics on that right now, but I, I will get back to you on it. Okay. Um, I know that VIA does support it, um, but I, I don't know specifically in Alamance what that will change. I think generally it would be good for us to know that, and also particularly with respect to the Diversion Center, would, that, would it change the, the, the care that's provided through that center? Okay. That's that's your specific, okay. I'll get back to you. Okay. And I'll just, I'll CC everyone so everyone knows. Thank you. How do, yeah. On the non-Medicaid service usage slide, it's got child and adult outpatient, 378, 56%. Where is all this outpatient service at? So um, it's broken down into different providers. So um, like RHA, most of theirs is outpatient. A lot of it is telehealth evaluation um, and a lot of it is peer support. So they're coming in, getting peer support services, which is great, you know, people that have been there yeah. and, and they can help them that way. Um, Carolina Health, Behavioral Care, um, that's mostly outpatient um, and also Trinity. So those are the second and third um, biggest providers in the county, mostly outpatient services, 30 minutes and over are what they're seeing. Oh, okay, so Does that answer your question? any idea of how long that, that person gets to stay an outpatient? Is that, you know, because this is mm -hmm. absolutely the not quick fix business. Yes. Yes. And I know we all are so hopeful that things are going to get fixed, mm -hmm. fixed. There's no such fixing word when it comes to human beings. You mm -hmm. fix buildings and pipes, but you can't fix people. Um, I'm just curious how this works. Um, working in the diversion issue yes. in the jail myself, it's, um, it's still up to that person. No matter right. what we lay at somebody's feet, it's still up to that person. Um, we keep having overdoses after overdoses after overdoses. And, um, and this goes right down to, you're talking about foster care. This is all connected when it comes to children because um, I don't know how many clients we have that grandparents or next of kin has custodial you know, power over the grandchildren because of the adult parents the lifestyles that they are addicted to that is making the choices for them. We say we are which we are, are our choices, but uh, many times fentanyl makes a choice for us. Yes. Time. Sometimes it just wants to take us off this world. And uh, no fear. I've never seen anything like it. Just no fear. You know, I asked somebody Friday, do you really just, do you want to die? Well, I hadn't never yet. It, it just blows my mind, but I'm not in those shoes, so I don't think that way but someone that's owned by a drug thinks yes. that way because the drug thinks for them. 
Uh, that's a real hard thing for the public to get past because um, a way we may look down upon people that go through this all the time. This is no different than anything else that owns us, domestic violence, anything. It's in control of all our decisions. So I just, I just see like Medicaid versus non-Medicaid. This is big money. This is a money pit <coughs> like I have never seen and it seems to never end. I had a friend once tell me she really battled depression and um, she said, Pam, it's like I'm falling in this pit and it's just black and I just keep falling and I keep wondering when I'm gonna hit so I can stop falling, but I never stop falling. I cannot imagine living my life that way and children in this nut system live that way because every day is never certain and usually, it's, you know, I don't, I don't go on travel and take a trash bag with my stuff. That seems to be their, their luggage as a trash bag. And uh, that does something to kids. It, it just blows their mind and just warps them. And um, we can spend all the money we want to and have all the meetings we want to and all the charts we have want to and all the people in Raleigh that some kind of can be totally removed from things. And um, it's still laying on the backs of these children. We've saw what COVID has done with being isolated and out of school. And we're gonna reap those, not benefits, but we're gonna see that for years to come. And um, I was at the Hunt Institute policy fellows thing, I got in that, and we had our second cohort this past weekend, last weekend, and um, we had Amy Gailey was there, thank goodness, and Ricky Hurtado and two other folks from the Senate House were just talking about education and what all was going on in education, and it's all in a bucket together. And the sad thing that's got in common is a child, and we are killing our children before they're dead. And we are gonna see that when it comes to them trying to leave something or be in charge of something. And bad has a tendency to be generational and just repeat itself. We see it in my husband's law practice. We've had grandfather, son, and grandson, all drug dealers. It's a learned business, it really is. You teach your kids how to play soccer, you can teach your kids how to sell heroin. It, I've never seen anything like it, and if we don't get a grasp of this, there is not enough votes, not enough budgets. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> I just see what it does. So, sorry, Karen. No, I love your heart, and I and the work you do is amazing. And you're right on all of these counts. And you know we need to be holding, you know, foster parents accountable. We need to have options for our kids who who fall into this trap of, of addiction. Yeah. And you know I counties are having all kinds of discussion because of what's going on and you know there's the discussion of MAT of medically uh -huh. assisted treatment but um, you know we really need to have the faith community and that service together because I think people need both um, but sometimes sometimes there's a divide and that's not going to help a community yeah and so you know I Stokes County is is the biggest I mean they are you know conservative and they have all been touched by addiction and so they are gung-ho on on finding solutions and we have they have asked us to set up a substance use task force and we meet monthly and it's a high level meeting um, and we are we are coming up with solutions and action items to help this problem because addictions that the sheriff's biggest issue in Stokes County so um, we're happy to help how we can because you're right um, our kids are dying yeah. and um, we there there are smart people at the table and we can figure out solutions together well we can't be afraid to call it what it really is I think sometimes we're so worried offending somebody with calling it nowadays everything's got a new definition I've never seen anything like our world to make excuses to fix our own agendas shame on all of us for doing that what it is it is you know stupid is stupid <laughs> I don't care what you call it stupid and um, it's just very frustrating to me because I know what gets on the backs of these kids. These kids go to school, they take it with them, and it shows out somewhere during the day. And then once again, they're getting something else laid on their backs. And um, we're just looking at the wrong person who's really responsible for all this. Yes, and the schools, you know, kind of the trends we're seeing is that they're, they don't really have an outlet. Um, and I've talked about this with one of the providers um, I think it's the academy, uh, but you know, say say a, a kid is, is separated from their parent, from their parents, from a foster family, or they're separated from their siblings and sent into foster care. They go back to school the next day, like nothing has happened, um, expected to participate, and you know they've experienced severe trauma, and so 
you know, what schools really need a safe place where these kids can come and, and just take a break, take a breather, um, and get the help they need. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot we can do. Well, schools have really took on everything. They're almost like the Department of DSS with a chalkboard because of all the programs that they have to do. The more programs they do that are not related to math and science and the very thing they were created to do, it gets a little bit thin and something suffers from it. And I know when we had families that would come into our shelter at Family View Services, the one thing we did, no matter where that shelter was located, that kid was going to go to their school because that's the most consistent thing in their life. They've had enough disruption. And I promise you, if the police are at your house at 3 o'clock in the morning where your father's beat the you-know-what out of your mother, you won't score good on your math test the next day. No way. And we shouldn't no expect them to. Yeah. So, once again, on the backs of kids. I personally would like to thank Vaya. Uh, I just returned Thursday from the, um, well, basically the, uh, the boards itself meeting. Uh, and they're working very, very hard right now on solving all of these, uh, many of these problems. And part of that is expanding the diversion center. Uh, so I want to say thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for being such a great partner. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Item number uh, six three, we're going to pull from the agenda. I'm saying these folks are not ready, um, and we're going to postpone that to the 15th. Um, Ms. York, that's correct, is it not? That's correct. That gives us the opportunity to talk with the Department of Commerce about a process that we would need to go through should the board decide they'd like to choose a different um, route for workforce development. And so. that's a fairly complicated process, is it not? We have not had any discussions yet, so we're not exactly <laughs> sure what that looks like, but yeah. we'll plan to bring that back to you at your August 15th meeting with better details. All right, so board, we're going to move item number 6-3 with permission of this board. Everyone agree? I just think we just need to agree. Yes. Yes. We're in agreement. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we're going now to item number 6-4. Mr. Atkins. Damn and gloom. <laughs> no. My reputation proceeds. No. My favorite tax guy but you in the world. It, but you do it with a smile, that's all. <laughs> well, that's the secret. That's the secret. Tax man coming. But, but yeah. he still sends out bills. I got mine last week. I did, I did too. too. What a uh -huh. fun sucker. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I will say, my, my predecessor, Gerald York. Uh, he had a saying, you know, people associate death and taxes, these inevitable things. <laughs> but he would say, you know, that's not true. And I said, what's well, not true? He said, some people beat me out of taxes. No one has ever beat death. <laughs> so uh, it's not quite the same. My goodness. Well, thank you for having me here this morning. This is our <clears throat> annual settlement of taxes collected. It'll take just a second to collect myself. I'll tell you what, um, what a presentation to follow. I ha have to admit, I kind of come in here sometimes thinking, is there a great joke I can lead out with or something <laughs> yeah. fun? But uh, that, that is a heavy situation. And, you know, I, I talk with our staff, uh, motivation, why do you do what you do? You know, what, what's the importance of collecting taxes? I say, you know, the thing is that there are people out there that are fighting for our children, and people out there that are fighting for our seniors, people out there that are, are doing the work that needs to be done, but they can't do it without support, without funding. I say, we're, we're, we're the armor bearers. We're, we're carrying along the supplies that they need to go and do their work. And to me, that makes my work meaningful. So um, our presentation is on the 2021-2022 taxes. So it's a little bit confusing because it's tax year 21, but it's fiscal year 22. They are the same thing. Now, <clears throat> for tax year 21, we began with a levy of $91,736,311.70. Of that, we collected $90,820,016.50. Uh, remaining uncollected, $916,295.65. That is a 99% collection rate. That is amazing. Which we are very excited about. Yeah. Um, to compare, I've brought the uh, previous five years' data, and as you can see, our average collection in the last five years was 98.75. So this uh, is also a 0.3% increase from last year. 
Now, 0.3% in a lot of places in life is absolutely nothing. Uh, but in our world, we call that 30 points. Uh, one hundredth of a percent is a point to us. And to go up 30 points, we are very excited. Uh, a lot of hard work went into that. This is a graph of our collection rate history, as much of it as I have. Our records only go back to 2000. Uh, anything prior to that is either stored in an in a obscure place or non-existent. But as you can see, from 2000 to 2008, there's a general decline. And from 8 to present, there's a general increase in the collection rate. Um, if you can imagine that curve kind of flattening off and rounding off, there's a little, divot, a little dip coming out of it. And we're now back to where it would have been without that. So for us, we consider ourselves to be back on track where we were shooting for to begin with. Obviously, the last few years, we've had some disruption. If we show these same rates in a tabular form, from the highest to the lowest, this is our highest year. As far as we know, this is the highest collection rate that we've had. If there was something back in the 90s, we'll pretend it doesn't exist because I don't know about it. <laughs> um, but as far as I know, that this is it. And I'm actually very proud. The first rate that I brought before this board was the top one in that bottom category, 2012, at 97.1. And it's nice to go from 97.1 to 99. Uh, in that year, we set the goal that we wanted to reach 99%. And so we've, we've been uh, setting that as our target each year since then. So I know I, my staff are very excited to be there. If we compare to some similar counties, uh, and, and the way this is chosen, the Department of Revenue has a listing of counties that group by population. We're in the largest category that they have. I take that list, I pull out the mountain and coastal counties because I think just the character of, of the community and economy is different. And from those, I compare population, valuation, value per population, and median household income. It's almost some measurements of, of relative wealth, because you could say, well, if you're relatively doing better or worse financially, that might impact your ability to pay. On that basis, the most similar counties are Pitt, Davison, Rowan, Randolph, and Catawba. The average of the five is 98.64, so the 99 compares favorably. Now, I'll, I'll note the most comparable are the first two, Pitt and Davison. Uh, Pitt has an amazing 99.42%. Davison has 97.59. So we're doing well versus the average, but there's certainly uh, the, the average is composed of high and low value. So we've got things to continue to shoot for and try to grow toward. Um, I don't know how to get to a 99.42, but we'll find out. We'll work on that. Um, but I, again, I'm very proud of, of our rate. I think it compares favorably with our, our peers. The actual amount collected, uh, just to note, is $1.4 million more than we collected last year, and that is growth in the tax base. And so even though revaluation isn't scheduled until next year, just the simple fact that folks are investing in the community and building, and et cetera, this is increasing our tax base. Um, and as you can see, we've had pretty steady growth. Now, there, there's the one place you can see is a, a tax rate increase. But for the most part, this is just growth in our community. So I think we've got some strong uh, financial basis uh, in Alamance County. Uh, to touch on briefly, we've entered our new normal period, our post-COVID new normal. Uh, one of the things that we are doing is that we are heavily teleworking. To begin with, I was real dubious about telework. Um, I thought it was a great idea from a safety perspective when COVID first broke out, but I was very concerned, would we have uh, the same level of productivity when folks are at home versus when they're in the office? Well, as you can see, we're, we're doing quite well, and this is true across the board. Uh, we use it throughout the department. Productivity is actually very high. Uh, there are some things we can't do from home. If you come in to, to make a payment at the counter, obviously that cannot be teleworked. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of our functions can be, and it's been very efficient. Uh, so we're happy with that. Uh, the challenge with the mail has mostly improved. Uh, last year we were struggling with being a month to even six weeks out on delivery of mail. And the problem that presents is, oh, oh yes, uh, the problem that presents is if I'm going to begin an enforcement, but for all I know, it's paid. It's just delayed. That, that causes us to hesitate. We would rather not enforce until a little bit later and feel more confident 
than risk enforcing on somebody who's already paid us. And the, the check's been in the mail for a month, and we're just waiting for it to arrive. Um, that is mostly remedied at this point. We're pretty much up to date, and that's been a big help this year. One of the reasons this year picked back up is those delays have been weeded out. We're still struggling with addressing uh, problems, and I'll, I'll give you the, the key illustration, is that we'll send out a, a bill to the correct address. It will return back to us with a little yellow label saying that we do not have the correct address. So our standard procedure is then to look for an alternate address that they might be at. Maybe we find one. We send it back out. But of course it's the wrong address because we sent it to the right address to start with. So that comes back to us the second time. Once we see that, we suppress future billing. We say, look, we've got a bad address here. Don't waste more uh, print and postage on it. Flag the account. And then if we have any contact with this person, we know we need to get an updated address. When it all shakes out, the original address was correct. And sometimes we've tried this by just resending to the same initial address and it goes straight through. So there is some still processing issue. The, the time uh, dilation is down, but something's still going on with the Postal Service. Uh, still, that's, that's much better than what it was last year. So we're, we're very happy with that. Let me indicate there, mm -hmm. back during COVID, of course, mm -hmm. we did lease the property um, on Maple Street, or place right. drugstore, of course. So we, as a county commission, mm -hmm. and you as a tax collector, tried to remedy that problem. Absolutely. Uh, and that that really was handled well by you folks. Thank you. We Thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. Additionally, I also got uh, one of my neighbors, who is a doctor, got a package for him at my back door last oh week. My. So, <laughs> and of course I hand delivered it. Absolutely. So the postal service has not cured all the ills. Yes, there's still some ongoing issue, indeed. Um, as we look to the future, I, I usually will give an outlook as to what our plans are for the coming year. And right now there's no major shift in plans. Uh, we're wanting to just refine what we have now. Uh, one of the advantages we have each year that we press forward on the collection rate is that we connect with people that we've not connected with before. And a lot of times, once we connect with them and they realize that we will, in fact, enforce the tax lien, we will require them to pay, in the following year, they just go ahead and pay. They didn't understand there was going to be enforcement, and now they do, so that takes care of the problem. This lets us move even further into the next year. So a lot of this is just refining down our process. We are trying to work with some efficiencies with our check scanners, and we've got some currency counters that will help us. And, uh, but it's all just refinement of the model in place at, at this point. Um, I do want to take the opportunity to thank this board uh, for your support uh, and everything, not just on the collection side of it. The board has always been very supportive of our department, making sure we have what we need, and that's very important. Uh, the other thing I really want to uh, take time out for is to thank our staff. This, these are our collections folks, uh, Sandy, Kathy, Michelle, Leslie, Jamie, Bree, Penny, and Renee, eight persons that brought in $90 million, and they worked very hard to do that. Um, sometimes challenging conditions because not everybody's happy with the way we bring in the tax revenue, and they have to just, you know, put on that smile and go to that next customer. Um, but I'm very proud of their work and just wanted to, to thank them and, and the whole staff that even support that team. Uh, it, it's a team effort and when, when they do well it makes me look good and I, I want to just pass the gratitude to them. So. And that's it for the slide presentation. Uh, do you have any questions about the uh, settlement? I, I'd like to make one comment if I might. Sure. Um, I had a constituent contact me and Jeremy and I have discussed it about a situation where we had not gone through the foreclosure proceedings to try and collect taxes on the property. And uh, from my experience in banking and dealing with uh, environmental issues and things of that nature, I know for an absolute fact that we don't want the county's name on the title because then we are required to do the cleanup cost. And uh, that was the situation in this particular piece of property. So there are some situations where we do not want to proceed against a piece of property because we will then be responsible for all of the cleanup and whatever work might be necessary because if there's contamination involved or something. Absolutely. 
Mr. Turner, any any questions or comments? No, thank you. Ms. Thompson. Good work. No, thank you. I just bring Mr. him Lynch. an occasional cookie every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> no lie. Such a suck off. <laughs> Keep these people happy. <laughs> Mr. Lashley? Uh, not at the present moment. Thank you all for all your hard work. I know your you. staff has done a wonderful job, and we Absolutely. do appreciate it. 99%. I think very, I very have good. two things. Sure. One, remind folks that don't pay their taxes on time, it costs. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to just mention that briefly? Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the cost of enforcement is borne by the person that is enforced upon. So we've got garnishment fees. If we have to come after a wage or after a bank account or whatever, it's $30 just to notice the individual, another 30 if we notice the bank or the employer. Additionally, if we go after a bank account, the banks a lot of times will charge a fee of up to $100 for having gone through that procedure. Uh, it's just it's very problematic. And the thing is that we have an excellent rate of interest. Uh, between 9 and 10 percent, depending on what year of the collection you're in. Uh, so certainly, rather than pay that interest, it's probably better to go ahead and get it taken care of. Yeah. And the last thing, uh, we need to pass an order for tax collection, do we not? Mm -hmm. We do. And so therefore, I would make a motion uh, that we as a board, uh, that you, Mr. Atkins, are authorized, empowered, and commanded to collect the taxes set forth in the tax record filed in the Office of the Tax Administrator and in the tax receipts herewith uh, delivered to you and the amounts from the taxpayers likewise therefrom set forth pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 105-321. Such taxes are uh, hereby declared to be a first lien upon all real property of the prospective taxpayers in the County of Alamance, and this order shall be a full and sufficient authority to direct, require, and enable you to label on and sell any real or personal property such pack taxpayers for and on account there, uh, thereof in accordance with the law. You are further authorized to call upon the Sheriff of Alamance County to levy and sell any real property and personal property of such taxpayers. And I would move that we do that today on the first day of August 2022. Do I have a second to that second. motion? Have a motion second. Any discussion? I just have a question. This is for going forward. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. No worries. <laughs> okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. And I have already signed it. Wonderful. <laughs> I have one more item and, and I'll be done. Uh, the charge off of 2012 taxes. And so the state limits us to a 10-year window to use our enforcement powers to collect taxes. After that, uh, someone can pay voluntarily, but there's nothing else that we can do to compel payment. And as of September 1st, the 2012 taxes are going to fall into that cutoff and we'll no longer be able to enforce them. What we do each year is we write them off effective September 1st. Now, obviously, we will try to collect all the way up to the buzzer. And if there's any collections, we've, uh, any enforcements we've issued prior to September 1st, they may actually go into effect. So if I garnish somebody on August 30th, it doesn't arrive until the next day and then sometime after that payroll processes. It doesn't matter that it's after September 1st, we might get that money in. So we do hold any of those open just to see if anything's going to come in before they're written off. But any other debt, if, we, if we've not been able to collect it in 10 years, once our enforcement powers are removed, the odds of getting that in are, are virtually zero. Um, the amount that's in the packet is the balance as of June 30th was $112,768.91. As of this morning, it stands at $105,771.15. And again, we'll continue to work on that uh, the rest of the way through until it's written off. So my request of the board is that uh, there be a motion authorizing it to be written off effective September 1st. This is 2012 tax year. So I move. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. I do have a question for you. Yes, yes absolutely. Not to get out of bounds and not to, but I just wanted to see uh, how we look in as we uh, enter in. 
I saw on the same text bill that he received. Mm -hmm. The 2023 is <laughs> coming up. Right. Absolutely. We're, we're progressing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. So we're on track with the work of being ready to send those notices out in January, have everything put in place. Um, our schedule of value should be ready. Our, our target date is October, October 1st, have it done. So probably the second meeting of October to have it in here to the board and go over that. There's three meetings that have to take place uh, to get that approved. And so that would be the first of three meetings to, to get the schedule approved. Now, right now, we just finished a market study in July. Every two months, we, we run a market study alongside the current work, trying to project forward. Um, as of July, it's really interesting. If you, if you take a lot of the data I'm finding online, it's not showing any turning. There's a lot of talk about turning, but there's not any turning. Now, if you use our internal sales data, uh, June, which was the last month in the July study, in fact, dips down. But as you see with you know, the, any of the graphs, it's this up and down action. I can't differentiate one month. It could be a fluke. So we're just kind of watching our final uh, the big market study will be in September. Um, at that point, whatever we come out with will have to be what it is, and there will be no time to revise at, at that point. Now, obviously, the board has the power up to the end of December. Now, let's say that the market were just to totally uh, crash, the bottom falls out. Uh, something the board may want to do at that point is pull the plug, postpone it one year, let the market fall, and then set to where market rates are rather than setting in relatively high rates while the market falls out from under. That's what happened in 2009. Uh, so the board still has the ability, even though I, I can't really revise anything after September, um, if there is a major shakeup, the board could always put the brakes on. Uh, but presumably, if there's no such situation, September would be it, and we just finish it out from there. Well, I have noticed recently, uh, uh, following real estate, that I have seen a number of properties where they've seen notices pop up that the sale price has been reduced anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So We're, it's not it doesn't look like it's in that same mm -hmm. upward trajectory mm -hmm. of uh, constantly climbing the prices and We're, we're getting more anomalies. Mm -hmm. And the thing about those anomalies are I think they're just leaders. I think they're showing what's going to become mm -hmm. normal. Right now you'll you'll see side by side something that indicates strong growth. But before there there weren't anomalies, you know, uh, they they pretty much were all predicting right. strong strong growth, and now you're getting more and more of these cropping up, and and that's what makes me nervous is you know we have to make a decision far enough in advance as far as the value after September I'm I'm locked, um, if something turns thereafter, I can't respond to it. The board can respond to it, uh, but I'd much rather either you know I've heard some predictions that it's just going to flatten out. And I think that would be great if we just flatten out. Uh, the other predictions are for things like some kind of radical decrease. And, and I'll be honest with you, I would rather that happen early and postpone it a year. Uh, because I remember what happened in 2009. I remember <laughs> one third of the county being under appeal. But, but you have to understand, if you raise somebody's taxes, because we, we brought it up, I believe, an average of 24% and then had to drop 8% back on that. So we, we ended up 16% up after all the appeals. If you're raising folks' assessments at the same time as the market's crashing, you're gonna have difficulty. And right now, if the market doesn't turn, we're trending 180, 185. When we do that during a crash. So that's why I say I'd rather need to flatten out, or if it's gonna do it, go ahead and do it now and let us back up and, and set where the market ends up. So basically uh, what you're telling me is uh, we have four months for this market to crap out, stay the same, or go higher. I mean, mm -hmm. that's basically the three choices that you have. <laughs> okay. I, well, I got my magic eight ball. I keep shaking it. You know, it says ask again later. I don't know. <laughs> well, the projected growth rate in prices has dropped from around uh, 15 to 17% down to about, like the last one I saw was 7.9%. So it's, mm -hmm. it's dropped in half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the realtors are informing us that instead of getting on day one 10 offers, you know, not, but sometimes not getting any on day one. Yeah. So that's, that's turning good. around as well. That's Let me good. ask you an entirely different question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last year, about this time, mm -hmm. I asked you uh, 
or stated, Alamance County used to give a discount if it was paid on or before, and it was, you know, August 1st or That's right. uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we no longer, well, it's such a small amount now Half that nobody pays early. Mm -hmm. uh, so it cost us interest. Interest rates are now, unlike last year, with the question are now rising. Mm -hmm. Do we need to look at that again, possibly giving early payers a discount, mm -hmm. but us also receiving the money early and earning interest on that money? That's something we could consider. The, the key thing would be to run an analysis of it. And as you said, with the change in interest rates, that changes all the formulas. I haven't looked at it uh, for this year, so I, I really, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, but we could run an analysis on it considering for next year. Is that something that we want to do going forward? I know that folks are very appreciative of the 2% and it's now down to half a percent. Um, half percent is still higher than what you can get on the deposit account right now. So <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, that's I a could, good return right out of the gate. I could, at a half percent, I'm happy leaving my money in the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. <laughs> you know, at the same time with 2%, a lot of folks will change their minds. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you could run that analysis, Absolutely. I think this board would appreciate it. Yeah, I will do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Thanks so much. You don't know what you do very well, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need any comments on the side. <laughs> okay. Oh, it is really a pleasure at this point to have a gentleman stand for me, please. Mr. Stevens. Yes, Would you please introduce yourself and give us a quick introduction? Sure, I'll come to the podium. Thank you. Well, that's a, a tough act to follow, um, <laughs> <laughs> to see the excellence that they, that Mr. Agins has done on behalf of the staff in collecting taxes, um, and, and also just everyone else I've met so far. Uh, my name is Rick Stevens. Uh, I'm here today to be considered for appointment as your county attorney, and I'm really excited about the opportunity. Uh, I've already met some really excellent folks um, who want to provide great service to the citizens here. Uh, I'm excited about the opportunity to do that too. Um, my background is uh, in law enforcement and I bring that commitment to excellence in working with elected officials, with the sheriff, with each of you. And uh, like I told each of you individually, I really appreciate having good, solid communication with the folks that I work for and I aim to carry that forward. So again, I'm just honored by the privilege to be here in front of you and uh, thank you for the opportunity. <coughs> Well, give the, the folks, we already know, we sure. interviewed you and had the pleasure of meeting you, and but the general audience does not. Sure. So tell us a little about yourself. Sure. So uh, I'm from Greensboro originally, born and raised here in North Carolina. Um, I've, for the last 20 years, been in various forms of public safety. Started my career in EMS, worked as a paramedic, went to college in D.C., uh, came back home, worked EMS for a while as well. I've been in law enforcement now. Uh, for a long time in various capacities as a sworn deputy sheriff for a number of years. Went back to law school in the evenings at North Carolina Central right down the street and uh, became an attorney for the sheriff in Guilford County and then later for the, uh, for the sheriff in Chatham County. And uh, I've also completed my MPA at Carolina. Uh, I'm dedicated to public service in North Carolina, dedicated to local government. I really appreciate the opportunity to have been educated in that and now just to bring it one step forward and really to to partner with Heidi and I've heard a lot of great things and looking forward to working with her and uh, just taking the county forward. I, there's some great people here and I'm just excited to be a part of the program. Well, we are excited. truly excited. To be and, and this is my fiance Shannon came today to spend some time and to see me off on my journey so thank you for being here as well. Uh, we welcome you both. Thank you. Thank you. Do we need a formal motion? Uh, we've already hired him. <laughs> I think he's already officially been appointed. Um, I think so. But we just wanted to welcome him here this morning, and today is his first day on the job as your new county attorney. Great. Excellent. Thank you all so much. I'm looking forward to it. Do we need? Thank I don't so know much. that he's appointed in an open meeting. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. So we will yeah. make a motion that we appoint you as our legal head legal counsel. Second. Any other comments? He, he didn't go to Wake Forest or the Naval Academy, so I guess it. <laughs> so he gets two, uh, two of my votes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Might explain how you spell Rick. 
Um, <laughs> sir, I, I'm not that. sure I fully understand that either. <laughs> um, all I can say is that my parents were ahead of their time in giving kids unique names. Mm -hmm. I've met a few other people who spelled R-I-K Rick the same way I do. Each of them have the same problem that I have. Uh, and I've told my parents that it's all well and good when you're three, but when, then when you're in your 30s and you're trying to be a working professional, it's hard to explain. But uh, I've held on to it. My first name is James. And I really had intended when I got to college to change to James until I found out that my roommate, who was randomly assigned, was also named James. And I just thought, you know what, it's not meant to be. So I've held on to it, and it's been okay. Well, you got cheated one letter, right? R got cheated one letter. That's okay. right. Exactly. <laughs> but if you use Frederick... <laughs> Which has a C in lost. it, I, and I don't, again, I don't fully understand. It's one of those things. Right, right, exactly. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. We I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you all. Mr. Johnson. First of all, I want to thank y'all for getting us a good county attorney. It's going to be very good to work with him, have an opportunity to talk with him on a couple of occasions, and I think he's going to be good. Also, before I get into mine, I would like to say what Ms. Donner said about Snapchat. Y'all gave us two technical people to work those computers, and what she is saying is absolutely correct on uh, the cartels and stuff, delivering and setting up, and by y'all doing that, we're going to stop some of this junk coming in this county, and I want to thank you for that. You asked a question about Medicaid. Uh, one thing that, that the Sheriff's Association looked at in the, the Medicaid is the fact that uh, when a person walks in that jail, their Medicaid stops immediately. And you will be surprised because of the drug problem, the amount of uh, physicians and, and medication that they're looking at, and it's costing the citizens of this county with the expansion of the Medicaid program. Of course, the whole state has to pick up that cost, not just Alamance County. And uh, just wanted to throw that in for you. Thank you. And the so, if you were able to take that person to a divergent center, then Medicaid wouldn't stop, correct? Well, if they're in custody, and they would be, your Medicaid will probably, and I say, I don't know for sure, but if you're in custody, Medicaid stops if you're in law enforcement custody. And if we take them there and drop them. Uh, for a mental health issue? Hmm? Would it be possible to take them initially to the diversion center before charges are pressed you obviously still could press charges later right we could uh, and then via would pick up with the medicaid that's something that y'all that would have to to look at because I, I can't answer that question i know when i come in that jail medicaid stops immediately Ms. and Stevens, it's a heck of a you already have a new county. assignment <laughs> i was actually taking notes on that yeah I, and, <laughs> I've heard of that issue before. I'm happy to research it and get the board an answer firmly on that issue. Yes. Good. Okay. That's all I can answer on that. What I'm <laughs> hearing for you. Uh, I'm, I want to advise commissioners that we have been uh, received $11,189 from the uh, Edward Bine Memorial Justice Grant Program, JAG, and that uh, we intend to use that in buying equipment, a piece of equipment, and a couple cameras. The, uh, equipment we want to buy uh, is a light that when we go on a crime scene we can identify uh, body fluids from humans blood when you can't see it with the human eye and also fingerprints to enhance our ability to make criminal cases uh, if you have any question Burlington and us were together Burlington basically filled out the grant because it's a shared thing but we get the our portion is eleven thousand one hundred eighty nine dollars Motion to approve. Second. Um, hold on. Deborah? Deborah, can you hear us? I can. Okay. Um, Fern JAG is one of the categories for the Governor's Crime Commission. I'm on that um, Crime Victim Services. We, but we score the grants. Should I recuse myself? If you are scoring grants and we are scoring grants, you do need to be excused. So if you would ask the board, or I can ask for you, if the other four, you can't vote, Commissioner Thompson, to excuse Commissioner Thompson for voting because of this ethical conflict before you vote on receiving these grant funds, that would be the appropriate next step. That's what I just said. Move to excuse Commissioner Thompson from the vote. Second. 
Do I need to go stand in the corner like you made me last time? No, we need to take a vote yep. first. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Thompson, we have to take okay. a vote first. Yeah. Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yes, you know. Thank you. And you may eat cookies while you're going away. <laughs> <laughs> Most vote. I had a, a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. I'd also like to, before I sit down, thank you all. Uh, I hope you'll hang on too to Miss Bashel. Uh, she has been a fantastic help to us, and he will be too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sheriff. You're welcome. Okay. Um, county manager's report. No report this morning. Thank you. All right. Before we go to commissioner's comments, could we bring you as county manager, Miss Stevens, Rick, and this board together for a photo? Sure. All right. Would you want to do it up front? Would you like to do that after the meeting? We can do it afterwards. Thomas, what is your yeah. preference? Um. Well, after. After. Do, it after. Yeah, after. do it after. Thank you. I just don't want anybody to escape. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. You, you had no comment? Correct. Excellent. That's the best report so far. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. No um, county commissioners, Mr. Turner. Nothing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nothing. Oh, you asked the wrong person. Right. Uh, I have a lot of things. Thanks, Thomas. Um, <laughs> now you understand my comment earlier, right? Uh, I want to ask a quick question uh, from our, our county manager. Mm -hmm. uh, just because uh, the, t the sheriff, do we have a grant writer for us on the county level? Um, we do have a grant writer position that works uh, under Ms. Rollins okay. um, as part of the budget office. He is assisting with the ARP funds and helping connect grant opportunities. Um, uh, can we get him to uh, report to us and just give us an update on, on how, we're, how we're doing with this, we this sure grant can. going Glad forward? Because I think he's only been in the position maybe two or three months. I think that's correct. So yes. I would just like to uh, get an update at least once a quarter. Sure. And if something comes down the pike sooner, it's good. It's good for me. We'll work on that for you. Thank uh, that you. was just one some something that, that came up. Okay. Now the the fourth thing I came up with today, and I'm doing it for our new our new 4-H person. I just wanted to let everyone know that um, the uh, voluntary agriculture district mm -hmm. preserve Alamance had some really good news this past week on our last meeting on June 21st. Uh, Brad Moore, who is uh, an advisor to this uh, board came out this uh, on June 21st to let us know, and I'm just going to read you his uh, email. I am pleased to let you know that he, Brad Moore, has been informed that all three of our preservation applications that were submitted last December have been selected by the state of North Carolina. And this is really good for the, city, uh, for the county of Alamance County because we have three farms that, uh, let's see here, if I look at my notes here real quick. There's three farms. Uh, the values, um, 106 acres from the Faulkner farm, 115 acres from the Aldrich farm, and 62 acres from the Fickle Creek farm. This total awarded to Alamance County is $565,000. This is really good for pres preserving our farmland in Alamance County. And the, the reason why this is important, there was a the state of North Carolina released the same week that uh, we are losing farmland at a record pace in the state of North Carolina. And that affects everyone in the state. And this is a great opportunity for Alamance County to preserve our farmland going forward. So I just wanted to uh, shout out to Mr. Moore and thank him so much for his hard work and dedication. And we still have more farms that are to, to be considered by the state, and we're really excited about that. So I just wanted to let the board know, and, and everyone in Alamance County know, that we are preserving farmland in Alamance County, and I'm very, very proud of that. So, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. Just two things. Um, I would like to give a big shout out to 
the United, the Congress in uh, Washington, D.C. for how they have royally screwed up the PACT Act, which was about our veterans. Um, the flip-flops that came from one side against the other um, has caused all these symptoms that I read you guys last time, that the, all the different kinds of cancers that would have been cared for, that soldiers had been exposed to the burn pits in um, Iraq and stuff and God knows what else. Um, they previously passed, the Senate previously passed it in June, and then um, one group decides to add in, I think it was $400 million for other stuff, and then the other, other side got ticked, and then they said no. And I would just like to tell these national leaders that you are playing with the lives of the very people who go to bat for your life. And you just seem to think that's just so, you can give a press conference, you can talk about it, you can do all this stuff. Meanwhile, it does not touch you. And I would like to encourage the entire House and Senate of the United States Congress to go sit in the oncology department, the waiting area that I sat in for two years every Thursday while my dad was getting chemo and I watched veterans, male and female, come all across the state to come in there and um, to treat all kinds of cancers, all kinds of horrendous situations that they had obtained by being around this kind of stuff with all these toxic exposures to these burn pits. It, it just blows my mind how we can get so lost in ourselves that we don't think about the very decisions of what we are doing to affect it. If you want to vote to declare a salamander the national insect animal of the world, you go for it. But don't put veterans in that same bill because that's what you do. You clump all this stuff into one and who got screwed is the veteran. It's like children. It's like veterans. It's like seniors. We just remove ourselves from any kind of responsibility and we play God Jr. on the TV all the time. It is absolutely infuriating. I'm calling my three out because um, you, you just, you know, you're just back and forth, back and forth. It's like a big game of tag. I've never seen anything out because there are people called American people and there's a lot more of us than you. And we're really wore out with you taking upon yourself to play God and leave these veterans who have suffered at the hands of war and all kind of other stuff and have come home with all these kind of diseases and injuries. It's, it's just absolutely ridiculous. It, it, oh. So, and one other thing is I just wanted to plant a seed. I hope it's a big seed, and it's about the art money. We have been totally quiet about this art money, and we've had this art money for a long time. We met with all kind of folks in the old courthouse. We've talked about them, and we've done nothing. We were on fire, trails just blazing when it comes to the diversion center, and we kind of hit or miss and talk about it. But I don't see, I want to know what's going on with that because the whole time we're talking about it, people are falling through the cracks and people are dying. Um, diversion Center is not going to fix the problems, but it's going to help to fix the problems because we're going to be facing the issue. And so I want to talk to you about the, um, the art money. And I had coffee with Bill, which he don't drink coffee. I don't know why he met me in a coffee shop. But anyway, um, about our ball fields and parks and recreation, I'm going to beat this horse till I beat its death. Um, I just want to say that whenever you have healthy lifestyles in your county, that attributes to the healthy future lifestyles. And I am a big investor in church. I mean, my, I mean church, yeah, but my church does big investment in children because they are the next generation to lead the church. You have to equip them and, and prepare them. But when we have ball fields that need like bleachers, they need concession stands, they need bathrooms because they can't operate, they need better lighting, they need lighting, they need better fencing, they, they need it all. And we're in partnership with the school system, but our parks and rec run athletics and sports through these, which is all some kids have. I mean, it is a big deal. When you have moms and dads and grandparents sitting in the bleachers cheering on their kids, they learn how to be part of a team. They learn how to win, and most importantly, they learn how to lose because you're going to lose in society. You've got to learn how to deal with that. Some of your biggest losses can contribute to your biggest you know, successes. So I really want us to think about putting some of this art money into these recommendations that Brian Baker has done. Um, I've met with two big corporations in our county to ask about if they wanted to, if they would consider making donations toward this. This wasn't asking, this was just testing the waters. And they're very committed. And you know, I thought about it. These people have already paid taxes. They pay a lot more taxes than I do because they're corporations. And we have money in our tax base, which, you know, we have a lot evidently. And it's been in there for a long time. And the people in the rural community all the way out to Sylvan, B. Everett Jordan, E.M. Holt, A.O., and all these other places that really need these upfield, upgrades on their ball fields, they pay taxes. And we can't forget the rural community. We saw uh, 
a really kind of hard headline in the newspaper last week about not listening to your people in your county. And I got emails, I know you guys did too, because if one thing we can never do is just close our ears to our public. Because without a public, they don't need us. We're here to represent them, and we need to listen to what they say. And I just think we need to really think about spending money, spending money, that'll be a biggie, on something that makes a difference. We've got money to make a difference. We spend on everything else. We drop money here for soil and water. We do infrastructure, which we have to do. But if we don't start focusing on health and well-being and investing in that, you know, I'd rather these kids be on the ball field, breaking a sweat, running up and down, being in the streets, shooting each other, or doing a heroin deal, because that's what they're doing. They're getting younger and younger and younger. I encourage you to come to my um, JCPC meet, and you will see the drugs effects, the drug effects on our young people because they've learned it's a family business. And we have got to do something to make sure they still make their own choices, that we are building our families instead of just arresting them. And I just encourage you to think about this. I know this is uh, not something we've probably done before because we've got areas that we give something to, but we never really go for it and go big. And I am planting a seed because this art money is all about <coughs> health and wellness and mental health and all that, but it's before the damage. It's the preventative measure. It's before the jail. It's before the addiction. It's before all of that. And we have got to start thinking that way. Prevention is so much cheaper than intervention, and it saves lives. So I just want you four to consider this. Bill and I talked about this, and um, I'm not saying you agreed. <laughs> I just said we talked about it. <laughs> I don't speak for anybody. But um, I just encourage us to start thinking differently because we've got to, because what's going on is not working. We keep building more and more and more to help the, the after. And it's really hard to fix all this, this damage. It really is. Children are abused. They just don't wake up and go, nothing happened. I'm great. And addiction never goes away. I uh, wish I could tell you what happened to me in a client Friday. It was unbelievable. I thought I was going to lose somebody in my car. So we got to think different. It's, I'm still not over it. This was just scary. So please, please think about our young people. Get them on the field. Get them running. Get them playing. Invest in them. We've got to do something. And if we've got this money as a one-time spend, we could really show the people out in Southern Alamance or Northern Alamance, man, they're really thinking about us too because look at our ball fields because this, this matters. We can put our families here. It's where families can gather and be real families and support each other and they know where their children are. A lot of people can't say that. So that's it. I, that's just, just it. I totally agree with Mr. Lashley. Uh, I'd like to hear back from the grant writer at our August 15 meeting. Uh, I've heard absolutely zero at this point. Uh, Sheriff Johnson, x-ray machine for the detention center, do you still not have that? No, sir. That's, that, that we've, it's on order. Just so it has been ordered. It's trying to work with the uh, with uh, our county on getting the uh, piggyback contract. Mm -hmm. Contract. All right. So it's imminent. Yes. All right. Thank you. It better happen. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like a report back if you if you will. Oh, that would be so important and helpful to law enforcement. Yes. Uh, helpful to the county. Um, Ms. Thompson, I'm in total agreement with you, but most of the ball fields are school-owned. They're the school system, um, so that would be outside of our... Now, on the other hand, Cedar Rock Park and things of that sort, um, I would encourage us to look at that carefully. So, but the, school, the ballparks and so forth that we typically use are owned by the school system and outside our... Uh, but if we Walmart. use them, I'm sorry to interrupt you, John, but if we use them, doesn't that mean we have a responsibility with them as well? It we does not. In partnership with the schools? Well, we already do that. We give the uh, school system already monies for that and all other uh, capital outlays. Uh, as to, uh, again, back to VIA, I just want to say thank you again. Uh, we've had regional meetings. We've also had 
Um, and, and Donald Reese doing a, doing a top-notch job um, with VIA, uh, and we're working on leases and so forth to expand the Diversion Center. Uh, that has not happened yet, but it's in, in the works. And I just want to say thank you, and that's all I have. County Attorney. Nothing for me today, sir. Uh, I'm taking notes and writing down priorities and just trying to learn from you all. So I appreciate that opportunity. Deborah, do you have anything for the board? I do not. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. <laughs> all in favor of, uh, say aye and leave. Aye. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, picture. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Rick, this. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.